Hi everybody, welcome back to Happy Little Diodes. Today we have an Issue 2 48K Spectrum in 4A repair. I'm carefully removing the lid because the keyboard membrane appears to be intact, I'm going to try and preserve it. This type of ULA has a bad reputation, so it's possible we'll have some issues there. We have OKI upper RAM chips, hence the mod at the top there with a little white lead going to the Z80. I'll put a link in the description to a video where we explain that mod. Here's the apparently intact keyboard membrane. It's quite fragile, but I'm going to try and preserve it. The quickest test I know is to check the current draw, and it's over 1 amp, which is way too much, so I pulled it out quite quickly, and we're going to have to figure out where that extra current draw is coming from. I don't want to cause any further damage, so I'm checking the voltages as quickly as I can. Just with the four corner pins of the lower RAM, we should see we have 0 for ground, plus 5, plus 12, yep, and minus 5. Okay, good, that looks good to me. The power circuit must be working. There's no video output, so I could start scoping around, but first of all, I'm just going to plug it in and feel for any hot chips. Yeah, the ROM chip is burning hot, so I think we found a problem. Let's just check the schematics so we know what we're dealing with. The ROM chip is IC5 in the middle there, and the problem we have is it's on fire. We'll have to remove it, so we will remove the motherboard from the case by unscrewing this little screw. and simply lifting the board out of the case. They're often kind of stuck, you have to give them a little bit of a pry, but they come out, and we can start desoldering the ROM chip. It was a bit faffy trying to get this one out. I had to do a lot of poking around the pins and using copper braid, but it did come out in the end. A quick inspection of the traces, everything looks okay. No obvious shorts and no obvious uh, cuts in the traces. Same for the bottom side. And before soldering anything back in, I just wanted to check the current draw again. Remember that previously it was over 1 amp. Well now with that ROM chip removed, we're down to 0 0.6, which means the ROM chip was drawing something like 400 milliamps. Now if the ROM chip was the only problem, I should be able to run a diagnostics ROM now. I could do that either by soldering a socket in and putting in a EEPROM with a diagnostic ROM image burned to it, or I can use this um, Interface 2 clone and use this ROM cartridge that we made in a previous video. You might notice that there's no video cable attached. I'm actually just listening for a beep that starts with the diagnostic ROM booting up. And since there was no beep, I'm going to do a quick composite mod so I can see the video output easily, and maybe that will help me diagnose the problem. Okay, lovely. Let's hook the video cable back up and let's plug in the diagnostic cart and see what we get. Yeah, that's not a good sign. Those black and white bars are usually indicative of a Z80 problem. I did a little bit of scoping around, but I didn't see anything. In fact, there was something I could have seen and I missed it, as you'll see later. But anyway, I decided to go ahead and remove the Z80. We do have the usual transistor mod on this issue too, so I need to carefully remove that from this via which it's soldered to. And now I can desolder the chip like usual. We're going to take our time removing this chip because we don't want to cause any further damage to the board. Here it is with the transistor still hanging on in there like some kind of silicon head crab. And I'm going to do a quick visual continuity check. That means I'm not referring to a schematic, I'm just going to check continuity from the joints or the pads to somewhere along the trace that comes from that pad. And finally I'm going to clear the joints of any excess solder so that the socket I'm going to put in will go in easily. In fact, let's have a close look at this. If you have some little dags coming from the joints, just touch it with a hot iron and they will nicely flow around the joint and your socket will go in easily. 
I've plugged the Z80 into this Frankenstein board from a previous video and I've realised I should probably remove this transistor mod before turning it on because I don't know what it's going to do with that lead hanging around there. We'll do this carefully in case uh, the Z80 is working because then we can just pop it back on and replace it into our issue 2 board. Dead quick test, there's no heatsink attached so let's not leave it powered on for very long and it booted up so the Z80 is working which means I didn't need to remove it but at least I've eliminated it as a possible cause of the problem. We know that the ROM isn't causing the problem because it's not attached to the board, nor the Z80 is working. So what does that leave? Well usually, as we've seen recently on the Issue 6s, we have this holy trinity of chips, the ZX8401, the Z80 CPU and the ROM, and if any of these fail you tend to get this kind of all-out failure mode. On the Issue 2 we have the Z80 and we have the ROM, and where we would have seen a ZX8401 on an Issue 6a, we actually have these six chips, or I think five of them, are uh, mimicked by the ZX8401 in the later models. These multiplexer chips are responsible for timing the addressing of the upper memory, which means they can cause some pretty catastrophic failure modes like the one we've seen here. As such, I'm going to socket them and try some new ones because I have some spares. Here they are. I actually got these as part of a 16 to 48k upgrade kit. Let's give it a quick try, and no, it doesn't work. Same failure mode. Or very similar, this time we had a black border but we still had the black and white lines with some random blocks. And we've pretty much eliminated all the chips that I think could have caused something like this, but it is possible that the RAM could fail in a way that totally destroys the whole system. So let's start scoping the data pins on each of the upper RAM chips. Here's the first one, looks good. The second one seems to be stuck at ground. And if we think about one of the data lines being stuck to ground, it's basically going to mean that every single value sent around the data bus is wrong, unless uh, that particular bit happens to be zero, which won't always be the case. In fact, let's just run over the schematic. Here's a schematic of an issue 2 board, and let's highlight the ULA, which is connected via the data bus directly to the lower RAM because the ULA needs to fetch graphical data, which is stored in the lower RAM in order to generate a video output. The upper RAM, where we have our suspected faulty chip, and the data bus, which is carrying data all over the place between the ULA, the lower RAM, the upper RAM, the ROM, and the CPU. We also have this bank of resistors, which effectively splits the data bus in two. This allows the CPU to get data from the upper RAM, or the ROM, or write data to the upper RAM, while the ULA is reading from the lower RAM. That's not relevant to our failure mode, but it does help us with diagnosing. If we highlight our data line, which is stuck at zero, and we artistically represent that we think it's shorted to ground through the upper RAM, we can see that any other action on this line from the ROM or the CPU is just going to be dragged down to ground through the upper RAM short. But because of the bank of resistors, any activity from the ULA to the lower RAM should still be taking place. So let's scope the same data line on the lower RAM. First of all, let's check the first data line. It should look the same. It does. And here's our second data line, the one which is shorted to ground. And if I can pause it at the right point, we can see that it's doing stuff, but only intermittently. I think what we're seeing here is the graphical data being fetched by the ULA which is why the ULA is still producing a video signal. Anyway, let's get this chip out and pop a new one in. And hey look, we fixed it. Nice one. But unfortunately when I tried to put the keyboard ribbon back in, it became evident that it broke. It basically fell apart, it was on its last legs, and it's for the best if we replace it with a shiny new one. This is disappointing because on the issue 2 spectrums the faceplate is glued on and sometimes I think they use cement. So I'm going to get the heat gun out and this orange scrapey tool thing and see what I can do. This was just a process of gently heating the glue and seeing how much I can work the orange scrapey tool thing through. It did come off eventually and I used WD-40 to loosen up the glue on the underside so I could clean it to make a good bond when I replace it. As you can see, we did a pretty good job in the end. I think that should go on nicely, and crucially, I didn't bend it. I also cleaned up the case, got the extra glue off there, that's looking good, 
and I also cleaned up the keyboard because why not? Easy to do, just warm soapy water and a toothbrush. You need to be careful because you can tear those rubber keyboards. Here's the new membrane which slots in as so. We can pop the keyboard on top and test it before we glue it up. I'm going to use the diagnostic ROM to check the keyboard's working and at the same time show you why I've been taking pictures of the video output it's because my capture card doesn't like issue 2's for some reason it tends to get a bit flickery like this uh, which doesn't look very good although I did want to show you the keyboard test going through everything looks fine so I'm happy to glue the faceplate back on I did start doing this using actual glue but I've realised that's not the best way to do it the best thing to use is this 3M double sided tip because you don't really need it to be on there permanently uh, you're going to need to remove it at some point in the future and let's face it people aren't going to be trying to pull the face plates off to test how strongly they're bonded on it's also a lot easier to work with than glue much less messy um, I'm not quite sure how long you have to keep pressure on for but I just kind of pushed it down for a couple of minutes last job uh, for me is to de-socket the ULA here we are, I've removed the socket and this allows me to fit a heatsink to it the heatsink otherwise just wouldn't fit in the case physically and also as I mentioned these ULAs tend to die so I think this one especially needs a heatsink as it appears to be in working order I'm also a little bit nervous of the two capacitors that sit next to the voltage regulator heatsink and also to protect the ULA I'm going to replace the 7805 with this Traco which is a switching regulator which will run cool now check this out to replace the broken ROM chip I've got this modern uh, ROM board which actually contains two ROMs um, I've had it loaded with a normal 48k spectrum ROM and a diagnostic ROM so that's really handy this switch chooses the ROM and it's actually accessible from the um, edge connector um, slot on the back of the case so you don't even need to take the lid off here it is in place and as you can see that switch is easily accessible I came over with a screwdriver but that's pretty nifty I loaded a game up from my Dandinator and everything seemed rosy until I tried loading audio as in loading a game from tape and it didn't work so let's scope around and see what's happening and when I eventually got the cables right I was able to see Manic Miner loading in as a waveform. There it is bouncing up and down, I think that's Manic Miner's foot. But when I scoped further down the line towards the ULA we actually just got a flat line. There it is, not good. Unfortunately there aren't many components involved in this part of the circuit which means our ULA is probably deaf. If we trace from the ear port to the ULA, we only have a resistor and a capacitor and I'm pretty sure they're not broken, so I do think we have a deaf ULA, which I've already soldered into the board. I think the lesson here is to fully test the ULA before desocketing it. Luckily I have this uh, spare ULA which is actually suitable for an issue 2 board, it's an older ULA. So I soldered that in and we were up and running, fully functioning specy. And that's about it for this guy. So thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, I hope you learned something and stay tuned for more videos coming soon.